Turn please to Matthew the sixth chapter. Matthew chapter six. We began on this recently talking about seeking the kingdom. And man, this thing's growing in me big time. And I'm believing with all I know for light. Would you believe with me? Yes. We have been, I said we, have been woefully ignorant of these things. Pitifully ignorant of what Jesus talked about all the time. This ought not be. We ought to emphasize what he emphasized. Right? We ought to be excited about what he was excited about. And uh, I'm believing that during these times and in these teachings, God's going to help me and you. Right? We're going to be enlightened. We're going to come up out of darkness and confusion. And our focus is going to be concentrated. Hallelujah. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, and about the 31st verse here. Let me pray before we read. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are agreeing together, asking you together for utterance. Utterance beyond me, Lord. Not me speaking, but you speaking through me and to us. Show us things we haven't seen, please. Open our eyes and ears and heart and mind. Unfold and reveal. Make known to us your person, your pleasure, your preferences, your ways, your will, your plan. Help us to see your priorities, what's important and first to you, that it may be that way to us. And we purpose not to be hearers only, forgetful hearers, but to put it into practice and do it and live by it. And we know when we do and as we do, we will be blessed because you always watch over your word and perform it in the lives of those who do. In Jesus' name, amen. If you believe that, say amen. That means amen. so be it. So be it. Everybody said out loud, I'm a doer, I'm a doer. Not, a not a hearer only. I'm a doer, I'm a doer. Not, a not a forgetful hearer. I'm a doer, I'm a doer. Of, the of the Word of God. Now you just got through saying, I get miracles. Because that is the key to getting miracles. Isn't that what Jesus' mother told him? at the wedding feast, of Can wedding feast of Canaan where the first miracle happened, what'd she say? Whatever he says to you, do it. And they did. And he did. And it did. And they had a miracle. And work exactly the same way for us today. Matthew 6.31. Can you tell something's happening here? Yes. Something's going on. Yes. <laughs> Whew. God's turning up the power. He's turning up the anointing. He's cranking it up for us. Well, let's, let's don't try to make it into something else. Let's let it be what it is. 631, Jesus said, Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Don't seek that. Don't think about that like the rest of the world does, the unsaved world, ungodly world. But verse 33, this is what you seek. This is what you focus on. You seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now, the Bible says that the Lord uh, the scepter of the Lord is the scepter of righteousness. He rules in righteousness. When every, every part of his oversight and rulership is right and fair and perfect and good and just. Do we seek what's right, what's good, what's fair, what's just? The kingdom of God and what's right. And if you'll do that, Seeking that instead of the necessities of life, where we're going to live, what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, those kind of things. Making a living. 
Now, not to say that you, you won't need to work. Everybody's supposed to work. And God wants witnesses in every area of life. And I'm firmly convinced there are people that are called to be a doctor or a nurse, some kind of technician, just like I'm called to preach. Did y'all hear me, saints? Or whatever field, you know, a policeman or whatever the, the, the area might be. God intends that there be witnesses in every walk of life. Hmm? That he's got people everywhere representing him. But in what you're doing and your plans and your dreams, it should not be just about your world, your family, your kingdom, seeking what you want and need, but seeking his kingdom. And his righteousness. Now, there's been an error in our circles. I'm talking about so called word of faith people, faith people, word people. And it has been and is, this is not something of the past, very much present. Many are seeking the principles of faith in God's word to assist them to be successful in their endeavors. And this is not the plan. <laughs> the plan is not using faith to build your kingdom. Hmm? Even your church, your ministry, because that's not the kingdom. We're to be kingdom minded. The more kingdom minded we are, the more quickly we'll work together. Hmm? Because I'm not concerned that mine not, might not be noticed. You're not so much concerned that yours might not be built. We're, we're thinking about building the kingdom. The kingdom. That's bigger than me. That's bigger than you. It's bigger than the, this one church. We're part of the kingdom. We're not the whole kingdom. By any means. Can you see this, saints? Not just using faith principles and confession, and faith, and sowing, just to get early retirement. Hmm? To be comfortable, to enjoy my hobbies, to take care of my family. You say, well, I need those things. The, the Bible said, he knows you need those things. <laughs> but he said, don't seek them. Hmm? Needing them is not the same as seeking them. Is it possible to seek something else and get that? Yes. Is that what he's saying? Yes. Seek my kingdom and I will add that to you. You'll get it. You'll get all that without running after it, thinking about it all the time, trying to get it like the unsaved world is. Everybody awake. Listen to the uh, Weiss translation of this, verse 33. Therefore, stop worrying, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the pagan Gentiles are diligently seeking. We're not supposed to be like them. They're, they're constantly worried about how they're going to pay their bills. Are we supposed to be like that? How many Christians do you reckon are like that? Constantly worried. About where am I going to get this? Where am I going? How are we going to get? The Lord told us don't do that, didn't He? Yes. Don't worry about that. Don't focus on that. What are we to do? Your your heavenly Father knows that you're in constant need of all these things, but be seeking first the kingdom and His righteousness, and all and these things, all of them, shall be added to you. Don't you like that? The RSV says, seek first his kingdom and righteousness and all these things shall be yours as well. In addition, another translation says, in addition to. Now back up to the previous part of this uh, chapter, verse 9. And you'll see he had already been talking about the kingdom. And when they asked him about prayer, Jesus instructed us to pray and we know, uh, this is what we call the Lord's Prayer. We know this is a pattern 
that in, involves so many things. It doesn't take long to pray this prayer, but you are touching on so many things. And how many of the Lord wasn't just wandering around? He's speaking what the Father gave him on this. And this is exactly our focus should be here, 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 and here. What did he say? This is, the Lord said, pray like this, after this manner. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Every prayer ought to begin with uh, your addressing the Father. Not a saint. Come on, are you listening? Not anybody else. Prayer is to the Father in Jesus' name. Period. Are you all with me? There is no justification in the Bible for praying to saints. Hmm? Praying to departed loved ones in the past and, and all this kind of thing. Prayer is to the Father in Jesus' name and you start off by reverencing Him. Is He holy? Is He awesome? <laughs> I think we have no idea. <laughs> Almost no idea. Maybe a little bit of idea. That's one thing I, I am seeing. The further I go with him, the, the more I begin to see how big he's got to be. Yes. He is, yes. I'd have to talk in tongues. I still wouldn't say it. He, he is so awesome. Well, just, just look at the creation. Look into the night sky. Think about all the planets and the stars out there. What kind of power it takes to hold all this together. And He's bigger than that. Yes. He made it. He's bigger than the universe. I know a lot of people don't believe it, but I can't help it if they're ignorant. <laughs> They'll find out one day. <laughs> Our Father, which art in heaven, where is He? Now, I mean, His, his presence is, is all around, but there is a sense in which He's in heaven, different from other places. Hallowed be thy name. You don't speak lightly of him or of Jesus. How many know you don't use Jesus as a byword or an exclamation? People use Jesus Christ as an exclamation or a that's that's blasphemy. That's not hmm? And, and a whole lot of people use the word God continuously. It is oh God, oh my God. That, that's uh, misusing the name. Or, uh, you, you should only say God, Jesus, when you're talking to him or about him. Yes. That's it. You don't use any of these things as a byword. How many of Christians don't use that phrase, oh my God? That's right. Don't use that. That's not right. That's disrespectful. He's not a byword, and certainly not the other stuff. Said out loud, hallowed be thy name. Be thy name. Glory to God. Glory. Then the first thing that he tells us to ask for, ask about is what? Verse 10. Thy kingdom, number one. Number one is what? Thy kingdom. Well, I thought number one was getting people saved. Same thing. That's part of it. Thy kingdom come. And the next sentence expounds on that phrase. Thy will be done. Because in his kingdom, his will is done. What is the kingdom of God? Kingdom is the king's domain, the king's dominion. The kingdom is where the king rules, what the king reigns over. And here's where many, many Christians believe wrong. If you asked, what does God rule over? What is God reigning over? Many would say, everything. And that is not true. I said, that is not true. We talked about this some weeks ago in the series, we talked about you choose. And about the popular phrases, God is in control. In control of what? Everything. God's in control of everything. Everybody, everything. Millions of Christians believe this adamantly. 
But was he in control of you? Everything you said yesterday? Everything you did? God was controlling you. Hmm? Whether you ate cornflakes or raisin bran, God controlled that. Hmm? There's a lot of stuff that's it, it's, it's held sacred, but it's contrary to the scriptures and the enemies behind it. Because he wants you to think that God's in control of everything, so you will blame him that's right. for all of the terrible stuff that's going on. And at the very least, just not understand why and feel cold about it. If God's will is being done perfectly throughout the earth, why do we need to pray that it would be done? Everybody said out loud, thy kingdom come. Thy will, thy will be done. How? On earth as it is in heaven. Let me ask you a question about heaven. You ever read about heaven? Hmm? How much crime do they have in heaven? Help me out. How? How much? How much? Are you sure zero? How, how much poverty in heaven? How much AIDS and cancer? How much? How many people starving to death? How many people mugging each other and shooting each other? How much? How much? Zero. You know why? Because God is in control. There. And soon, he's going to be in control everywhere around here. But right now, no. All the stuff that's going down there, on down here is not the will of God. And it's not God controlling it and making it happen. <laughs> Selah. Keep reading. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Keep going. Give us this day our daily bread. Let's read the rest of it. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so he ends up now where he started out. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Everybody said that last phrase out a couple of times out loud. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We don't yet see it all manifest, but it will be. Hallelujah. And it's destined to be that way. And it will be that way. Say it out loud again. For thine, For thine is, the is the kingdom and the power and the glory, and the glory forever. forever. One more time. Thine, thine is, is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Whose? His. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Go with me to Luke, please, chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. I know we touched on this, but I want us to, to look at it again. You believing with me? Yes. Now, if you hear something that doesn't sound like what you've believed and thought. Don't just say, well, I don't know if I, believe, I agree with that preacher. Uh, get, get your eyes off of me. Is it the Word or not? What did the Scripture say? What does the Word say? You know, uh, those of you that have been in the church here for a while, you know what a couple of years ago I've, I've been asking you, believe with me. I, I'm, I'm believing, we're believing to see, for God to show us what's Him. And what's not him? Hmm? He's answering our prayer. I said he's answering our prayer. He has been for some time now. It's exciting. We're changing. Some changes don't happen all at once, but one thing is added to another, is added to another. God's, God's taken us somewhere. He's getting us to another place from where we've been. We're becoming different people. We're seeing things differently. Thank you, Lord. Are we thankful for that? Amen. Let's just tell him, Lord, thank you. Thank you 
for hearing our prayers. Thank you for answering our prayers. Thank you for having mercy on us, not leaving us in darkness, but enlightening us. Thank you. Thank you for showing us what's you and what's not you, what's true and what's not true. Thank you for bringing us into the reality of truth, setting us free from ungodly tradition and, and junk and lies and deception. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, no matter how long you've believed something and how strongly you believe it, that doesn't make it true. <laughs> Believing something doesn't make it true. Can you believe a lie? Sometimes people say, well, you know, millions of people can't be wrong. Oh, yes, they can. Oh, millions of people can believe the same lie for generation after generation. Yes, they can. But you shall know the truth. And the truth, hallelujah, will make you free. Where are you? Luke 4? Good. In Luke 4, we see where that Jesus was filled with the Spirit and then led into the wilderness where he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights. Was he tempted? Hmm? The Bible said he was. We believe the word, don't we? Look at verse uh, 2. Well, verse 1, Jesus being full of the Holy Spirit returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Now, that's not the devil's account of it. That's the Holy Spirit saying it through Luke. So was Jesus tempted? Yes, yes he was. He was tempted for this duration. In those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended he afterward hungered. And the devil said to him, is there a devil? Yes. Is he real? Yes. Yeah. He's an ancient being. And he's not an earthling. He's an alien. Do you know why I say these things? We need to break free from our religious junk. These things are real. They're not fairy tales. They're not stories. Somebody say, you think there's life out there? Oh yeah. There always has been. Angels, the devil, demons, hmm? many of them are not, they're not Terran, <laughs> they're extraterrestrial, they're not from here. And we don't know everything that's gone on in the previous ages, we only had a little bit revealed to us. But this being called the devil is talking to Jesus and tempting him and said, if you be the son of God, command it this stone, this stone that it be made bread. How many know, no matter if you could do it or how hungry you would be to want to do it, you don't need to do what the devil tells you to do. This is the big deal. How did our, our parents get in trouble, Adam and Eve, in the garden? What did they do? They did what he suggested and told them to do. And in essence, they, they stopped trusting what God told them and rebelled against the clear directions God gave them and yielded to this being and did what he said. And now the devil is trying to get Jesus to do that same thing. To ignore what the Father has said, what the Word has said, and to listen to Him and do what He says. But He refused to do it. He's my hero. How about you? <laughs> the, the, you see through this what 1 John talks about, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. That's, that's the devil's three big areas that he hits. And it's always worked on everybody since Adam and Eve until now. <laughs> if he didn't get them on one, he got them on two. If he didn't get them on two, he got them on three. But everybody he always got. He always got them. 
In essence, he always got them to do what he did, rebel, and say, no, I'm not going to do what God told me to do. I'm going to do this. And sadly, none of us can say we're the exception. All of us have sinned, which is to say the same thing. We, we knew to do and didn't do. But Jesus, <laughs> and he didn't do it as God. He did it as a man with no unfair advantage over us. He emptied himself of his mighty weight and glory and power and became like other men, Philippians said. He did it just like you or I would have to do it, proving it can be done. <laughs> So nobody in time to come will be able to stand up in judgment and go, that was just too bad. Nobody could do it. And then the Father will point to Jesus. And, say, <laughs> and if they say, yeah, but that was Jesus. Yeah, but he did it as a man. He did it as a man. Elsewise, how, how would it be fair to anybody to be judged? So verse 4. Jesus said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Does it pay to know the word and let the word live in you strong? That's one reason you read your chapter every day, Monday through Friday, right? Because people who are ignorant of the word are easily deceived, easily misled, easily confused. But when you know the word, no matter what the devil tries to pull on you, you go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait. The word says this. So that can't be right. Yes. And you don't yield to it. Verse 5. The devil takes him up into a high mountain and showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Did this really happen? Yes. If you believe the Bible, you have to believe it happened. Is the devil a real being? Yes. He is. And most Christians get in a ditch on one side or the other with this. They either just want to try to ignore and pretend that there is no devil or they get in the other ditch and they're scared of the devil. Oh, they're afraid. Oh, don't tell. He's, he's awful. They, and, and, and of course, he's behind this. Don't watch horror shows and shows about demons so-called. What does Hollywood know about a demon? They exist, but they're nothing at all like the monsters that a lot of these folks portray. Why? Well, the devil wants you to be scared of him. He wants you to believe that he and, and his minions, demons, are, are these monstrous, evil, you know, overwhelmingly powerful things. And it's just a lie. I said it's a lie. The child of God has no reason to be afraid of the devil. In fact, if we resist him in Jesus' name, what the Bible said, he will, he will run from you. Is that Bible or not? But, you, but on the other hand, you don't need to pretend that he's not real. That's going to get you in trouble too. What did it say? He took him up, high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now, we know one of the greatest kingdoms in the world at that time was Rome. They were the world, preeminent world power. But whatever other kingdoms there were, all over the world, the devil showed him those kingdoms. Verse 6, let's just stop right here. Why is he showing him these things? Because he's working up a temptation here. He's setting him up to tempt him. Was Jesus tempted through these things? The Bible said he was. And the devil said, all this power will I give you. The devil is telling Jesus he's going to give him something. <laughs> now most Christians read that and scoff and go, that's ridiculous. The devil, never. it was real. And it's a temptation yes. to Jesus. There's a reason I'm going over this slowly. 
Most Christians don't even believe this verse, this sixth verse. They do not believe this. If they did, they'd stop hollering, God's in control. <laughs> now, granted, if you want to back way off and say God's in control, that he's allowing all this, but he has a plan that will succeed, it's the truth. He is the sovereign God and Lord. But he is allowing the devil through human beings to control most of this planet right now. And all you got to do to know that that's true is realize how different it is from heaven. Right? If God was really in control of it, would it be in the mess that it's in? It would not. So the devil said, all this power will I give you and the glory of them, for that is delivered to me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. True or not? Has to be true. I know the devil's a liar, but this has to be true or it would not have been a temptation. Jesus would have known it wasn't true and it wouldn't have been a temptation. Verse 7. If you therefore will worship me, what's the devil wanting Jesus to do? Huh? See, this is the devil's fixation. He's real. He's a real being. We have some light about him in Ezekiel and in Isaiah that he was not created the evil being that he is today but that he was in the presence of God. He was an anointed cherub. He was. We don't know how long. Perhaps it was for millennia, I don't, eons, I don't know. But there came a point where it wasn't enough for him anymore. Even though God had given him so much place and so much glory, iniquity was found in him. He wasn't tempted, he created the pride and the rebellion. And he rebelled against God. And he led others of his kind in the rebellion and they rose up against God. Now I know this sounds crazy to us, but they must have thought they had a chance to succeed. We need to embrace these things or else we're going to believe lies. We're going to stay mired in tradition that's not reality and truth. There has been conflict in heaven. There's been conflict with the beings that have been created. There has been pride and rebellion against God. And he hates these things. And there's a lot more reason for it than we even know about. We don't know all the things that have happened in times past till now. But God is, through these successive generations here on the planet, Preparing a people for himself yes. that could do anything they wanted to in this lifetime. He didn't make us. He left it up to us. And many of them won't choose him and won't let him reign over them. But there are some. I said there are some that have willingly bowed their knee to him and confessed Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and said, Lord, reign over me. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And he is reigning over them. You know how you can tell where he's reigning? You will see freedom, deliverance, cleansing, healing. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Provision, goodness. Yes. That's where he's reigning. Yes. Where you see these kind of things. Every good gift. Every perfect gift. Hallelujah. And even though the devil and the angels that followed him and these demons, wherever they came from, these spirits that have obviously rebelled against him, you and I, after having been proven in this life, will be the faithful ones. And I don't believe we will ever rebel against him throughout the ages to come. 
Because we know what it, we know what sin is. Yes. We know what the curse is. Yes. Can you imagine a million years from now somebody coming to you and saying, "Hey, let's rebel against God." <laughs> what are you going to say? You're going to say, "Hey, I was on the earth, okay? <laughs> I experienced what the curse is and what death is. No way. Not now, not ever. He is my king. He is my Lord. That doesn't oppress me. He's worthy to be over me. Forever, he's my creator. Why would I think anything else? <laughs> we are his special ones. We are the ones that chose him that didn't have to. Glory to God. We are the ones that are holding to him in this life through trials and tests, problems, challenges, holding to him. Somebody say holding to him. Holding to him. You're going to let him go? You're going to get mad at him? You're going to get haughty and proud against him? You're going to rebel? No, that's the devil. That's the devil. That's his bunch. That's got nothing to do with me. <laughs> He's my king. And always will be. My greatest joy and exultation throughout eternity is for him to say, I'm his. And to be under him. And do anything he wants me to do. That's not oppression. Say it out loud. I will never rebel like the devil against my God. What's the devil telling Jesus to do? He's telling him to do what he did. To do what he got Adam and Eve to do. He's saying, don't listen to God. Listen to me. Fall down. Worship me. The devil's obsessed with this. <laughs> and he's never going to get it. Are you kidding me? What kind of God would he make? He's, he's no equal opposite to God. He's a created being who's fallen from his place. He's nowhere near God. Never will be. God's only allowing him a little time and space here. Soon to be over. But for now... This is true. The kingdoms of this world are under his influence. A lot of people don't like to believe that, but it's a fact. It's the truth. Let me give you a few scriptures to go with this. Can you take it or not? Yes. <laughs> I'm getting different looks across the crowd, but I'm going to keep going. John 1430, they'll put it up on the screen for us. Jesus said, Right before he left here, Jesus said in John 14, 30, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes. Who's he talking about? This world prince is the same, world, same word translated ruler. Many other places in the same New Testament. The ruler of this world. Who called the devil the ruler of this world? Jesus did. This is not the only time. He did it two or three times just in the book of John alone. But notice this, the prince of this world comes and he has nothing in me. Don't you like that? He may be the prince of this world, the ruler of this world, but he's not ruler over me. Why? <laughs> Glory to God. I'm, I'm trying to get ahead of myself. The ruler of this world. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. Verse 3. He said, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Now, 
In Matthew and also in Luke, Jesus said, until John the Baptist, the law and the prophets were preached. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and people are pressing into it and the violent take it by force. You remember that? And he also said to some of the most religious leaders of the day, he said, you are, you are preventing people, basically, I'm using my words, from going into the kingdom. You remember him saying that? Yeah. I need to give you the, the verse. Are you believing with me? Yeah. This is so big. Stay where you are. Just listen to this. Matthew 23, 13. Jesus said, to the, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. The religious leaders were working to keep the people out of the kingdom of God. Well, who's influencing them? These are the heads of the synagogue in Jesus' day. And what they're doing is actively keeping people out of the kingdom. Isn't that something? Luke eleven fifty two, 52. He said, Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. Religion is the biggest hindrance to people getting in the kingdom that there is. Because it's a substitute for faith and getting in the kingdom, being born again. Go to 2 Corinthians 4, please. 2 Corinthians 4, 3, you see that's exactly what's happening. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, verse 4, in whom the God of this world, who's that talking about? That's the one that showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, they're mine. And I'll give them to you if you'll fall down and worship me. The God of this world has done what? Why would he do that? To keep them out. Keep them out. Out of the kingdom. Out of the family. There is this massive Deception, planet-wide, to keep people in the dark that there is a God, that there is a devil, that this conflict has been going on, Jesus has paid the price, the way has been made to get in. But how many know most of the world, much of the world is oblivious to this? They're living their lives, they've got no clue. You even talk about some of these spiritual things and they'd scoff and mock and say it's superstition and... But the truth is they're just completely uh, limited to a physical existence and they're ignorant of reality. Aren't you glad the Lord's given us some light? Yes. We're not just, because that's why we'd be just as blind as anybody else. Not to say we know all that much, but thank God for what we do know. Yes. It's sure helping us, isn't it? The God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine unto them. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. And I like what Jesus said. He said the, the, the prince, the ruler of this world comes, but he has nothing in me. Why does he have nothing in me? Because of what Colossians says. You need to go to Colossians now. Colossians 1. And verse 12, I'm reading in the NIV. Can you stay with me a few more minutes here? Stay with me. You're believing with me, right? That means if I start a sentence, you're going to help me finish it, right? Is that, is that right? Huh? Because you are awake and you are in tune and you are focused. And you're not just thinking about me, you're thinking about him. You're listening to him. I'm listening to him. Verse 12 says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. You know why he qualified you? 
because it's the only way you'd have ever been qualified. <laughs> you and I would have never been able to self-qualify. So he qualified us when we put our faith in him. Verse 13, for he has rescued us. Oh, somebody shout about this. He, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness that's controlling this whole world, that's influencing this whole planet. You and I, by the grace of God, have broken out of the darkness. And we're in the world, but the darkness of this world is not ruling over us. And the devil is not my Lord. He's not my prince. He may be the God of this world, but he's got nothing on me, nothing over me. I'm nothing to him. Why? Because I have been translated out of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom. Hallelujah. Who the kingdom of his beloved son. How did this happen? It happened when we believed on him and when we bowed our knee to him and confessed his lordship. Hallelujah. We were translated. Somebody say translated. Translated is to be taken out of one, transported and put into another. I'm in this world, but I'm not in this kingdom. Glory to God. I'm not subject to the rulership of the evil one. If he tries to tell me something, I can completely ignore him. I can tell him to shut up and hit the road. <laughs> of course, that's, that's very insulting to him because he pumps himself up to be the God of this world. But he's nothing to me. I said he's nothing to me. Oh, yeah, he wants to be worshipped. He's got a lot of people duped. But you and I are never worshipping him. Never. I have a Lord. I have a Lord. He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. He's the greatest. He's the greatest there's ever been or ever will be. And I've been and you've been delivered from the power of darkness. Somebody say, he has delivered me from the power, the dominion of darkness. Glory to God. I have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Go with me to the book of Luke, please. Luke 18. Oh, thank you, Master. I'm talking specifically about how to get in the kingdom, how to enter the kingdom. Uh, I should say something else before we, we say this. Sorry if I'm bouncing around a little bit. I've never preached this before. I've, I'm, I'm believing for light as I give it to you. Are you, you said you're believing with me, right? Uh, yeah, that'll be fine. Luke uh, 18. Let's go about verse 16 or so. People came to Jesus and they asked him if there were few that would be saved. You remember that? And he told them that there's a broad way that leads to destruction, but a straight and a narrow way, and there were few that find it. 
Will everybody be saved? No, sadly, they will not be. I know some people try to say that, but it's contrary to the Scriptures. And if we find out later that more people were saved than we thought there would be, glory to God. I hope so. But to tell folks that everybody is eventually going to be saved is contrary to the Bible. It's just not true. Now we do know that numerically there's going to be a substantial number. Uh, if you read Revelation, you'll see that it says in one place that uh, the Lord saw those that had been redeemed and there were a thousand times 10,000. There were thousands of thousands. Well, that's a hundred million and millions that's a lot of people. That's us. But there's seven billion on the planet right now. So that's not everybody. Are y'all with me? And if you're talking about that many billions and you're talking about hundreds of millions, well, that is few. Compare. And he said that there will be those in that day that will say, Lord, Lord. And he said, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. But those that do the will of God. Now in Luke 18, I said all that to, to set this up. Luke 18, there, there are two primary things, I believe, that are so simple about entering in to the kingdom of God. Luke 18 and 16. They brought little children, and uh, the disciples tried to send them away, infants. But verse 16, Jesus called them and said, Suffer little children to come to me, forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. We're getting insight into the kingdom of God. Of such. Verily I say to you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God, how? As a child. Now th this is a little child. Little child. Shall in no wise enter therein. You can't get into the kingdom unless you receive the kingdom as a little child. Keep reading. A certain ruler asked him, said, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And if you skip down, Jesus told him, verse 22, Sell what you have, distribute to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven, follow me. He was sorrowful. He went away. Verse 24, Jesus, when he saw that he was very sorrowful, how hardly shall they that have riches enter the kingdom of God? He's continuing to talk about how you get in. Because there's a whole lot of people that's not going to get in. I know that's a sobering thought, but we have to preach the Bible, don't we? How do you get in? What was this problem? It wasn't just having riches. Read, read the next part of it. He said, uh, how hardly shall they that have riches. It's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. If you read the other accounts, he talks about trusting in riches. The issues here, he brings up these two. Like a child and trusting. And you'll see that in talking about a child, he talks about the one that would humble himself as a little child. Matthew talks about it. Others talk about it. Said out loud, humility and faith. Amen. What is it that you confess to be born again? Hmm? What do you confess? Anybody remember? John 10.10. 10. If you'll confess with your mouth. What? Not just Jesus is Savior. Jesus is what? That requires Submission. Are you with me, saints? That's what the devil is refusing to do. That's what he convinced our parents to throw off. 
That's what he's trying to get Jesus to do. Have you ever been rebellious? Yes. Have you ever been stubborn? Yes. Hard-headed? Yes. Hmm? Yes. Have, you ever, have you ever braced and went... <laughs> oh, it starts young. It starts young. Have you ever heard young ones look at you and they've been so sweet and been so great and then all at once they go, no. <laughs> People laugh. It ain't funny. It ain't funny. It's, it's one of the biggest things that's wrong with the whole planet. No. Because people that are 20 years old and 30 years old and 60 and 70 and 80 are doing the same thing with God. Day in and day out, no. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. I'm going to do what I want. You can't tell me. And a lot of times they think it's just people that they have problems with, but God is trying to speak to them through people. And they're getting so mad and getting so upset. And look, hey, it's a free country. You can't tell me how to live. A lot of times what they're saying is nobody can tell me how to live, including the Lord. Do you have a Lord? Yes. Anybody in here, do you have a Lord? Yes. Not, not Savior only, but Lord. Yes. Say that loud, He's my, Lord. He's my Lord. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means He tells you what to do, yes. and you do it. Yes. There'll be times He'll tell you what to do, and you won't want to do it. <clears throat> oh, yeah. That's when submission comes in. That's when you submit yourself. That's when you pray and say what Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. Is Jesus the perfect example? He's the perfect example of this. He said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And I do always those things that please him. How do you get into the kingdom of God? Humble yourself. Like a little child. Because in front of him, what are we? Premies. In front of him? <laughs> I don't care what you think you might know. It's not the bottom of a thimble. Compared to what he knows, right? Should we on a regular basis humble ourselves before him? And go, God, you, you are, you're the almighty. I submit myself under your hand. I submit myself under the Lordship of Jesus. Whatever you say, whatever you say is the way it's going to be. And then when he says something, like he said to this rich young ruler, what do you do? You trust him, right? You trust him and you do it. You do the opposite of what the devil and his bunch did. They, he rose up in pride. I will be like the most high. I will do this and that. And he led rebellion. We're going to do the opposite of that. We're going to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And what's the result of that? He's going to exalt us. He's going to promote us. We're going to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and we're going to trust Him and obey Him and let Him be Lord. And if we're letting Him be Lord, there's going to be evidence that He's reigning in our life. His goodness is going to be seen. His blessing is going to be seen. And it'll be a light and it'll be a witness. Can you say so be it? Amen. Stand on your feet.